John 6, drop down if you would to verse 60. John 6, dropping down to verse 60. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some among you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. Therefore, Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, who will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied to them, didn't I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He was referring to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, one of the twelve, because he was going to betray him. Uh, please leave your Bible open. I'm going to be working uh, from different angles in John 6. I want to begin in verse 60. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? This teaching, this word, Jesus, that you're sharing, it's hard. Who can accept it? This word, this teaching, it's hard. Who can accept it? It's difficult. Who can accept it? We have to understand, as we've shared earlier this week, that it is Jesus speaking to the crowd. It is Jesus tonight speaking to me. It is Jesus speaking to you. This is not a man speaking to other men. This is Jesus Christ, God Himself, speaking to us. We pay attention. In the words of the prophet Amos, the lion has roared, who will not be afraid? We have reason to pay attention. We have reason to have our hearts quicken. We have reason to come alive in our minds and in our souls to listen to the one who is speaking because this is God. This is not man speaking to man. This is God speaking to man. This is God speaking to me and God speaking to you. This teaching, this word, it is coming from Christ. And I wrote down several words that I believe describe, if you will, this teaching, this word. Not only in John 6, but throughout the tenor of Scripture. And I remind you that when you read the Bible, you are reading the words of Jesus. When you read the creation narrative, you are in essence reading the words of Jesus. When Malachi is speaking, you are reading the words of Jesus. When you read the Gospels, you are reading the words of Jesus. When you move to the Apostle Paul, you are reading the words of Jesus. When you read about John's vision of eternity as it will be, you are reading the words of Jesus. So I think these words not only apply to what's being shared in John 6, but they apply to the entire tenor of Scripture. Here are words that have helped me understand, and I hope they help you understand. These words are coming from Christ, therefore they are final, they are authoritative, they are non-negotiable, they are life-changing, they are life-giving, they are confrontational, they are eternal. Now let me describe what I mean by each word. They are final, and I mean this in the earthly sense. They are final in that Jesus is not going to speak something today only to have it changed tomorrow. Jesus is not going to reveal His will this week only to have it change next week. What is true this year will still be true next year. Amen? He speaks His word to me, and in the earthly sense, it is final. Now, there are many things in the church that can change with God's permission. There are many things in the church that can evolve, should evolve, but there are certain things that must remain a constant. When we come to the integrity of the Word, when we come to the truth, the truth does not change, the truth does not evolve. 
There are things culturally that we can change. There are things culturally that we can concede. But when it comes to the truth as revealed by God himself, God has spoken a final word in the earthly sense. People will come to me and they will ask hard questions because they know I'm a Christian and they know that I'm a pastor. And they ask hard questions. And I simply, in answering them, I echo the word of God. And I try to explain to people, this is not my idea, this is God's idea. This is not my conviction, this is God's conviction. Uh, in particular, in this day and age, uh, we have to wrestle with some hard questions concerning human sexuality. And when I answer in a biblical way, I am always very quick to say, this is not the idea of me, and it's not the idea of the established church. This is the idea of God. These are the convictions not of a man, not of an organization. These are the convictions of God. And this truth does not evolve, and this truth cannot be a concession to the greater culture. Amen? It's final. Very much in the earthly sense, from beginning to end, it is final. It's authoritative. I Meaning this, it is coming from a higher authority. I have no right to change the Word of God. Why? Because I am not over the Word. Often we think that we are over the Word. We think that we can read something and we can have an exchange of ideas and if it's palatable, if we find it to be acceptable, if we think that we are willing to live by it, then we embrace it. But if we think for some reason that it's a bother, if we think there's going to be a cost, if we think there's going to be uh, somehow a kickback, if we stand on this truth, then we are very willing to do what? We're very willing to change it. Okay? We act as though we have authority over the Word. The Word is authoritative because it comes from the King. Amen. The subjects do not dictate the authority of the Word. The King dictates the authority of the Word. So His Word, His teaching, it is final. It is authoritative. It is non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. How many times have I tried to negotiate with God? I have, and I know that you have. There are times that we have tried to give and take with God. Okay, God, I understand you're making a demand of me here. Now, if I meet that demand, then how about you go easy on me over here? Okay, well, well God, if you're going to make the demand here, that's fine. I'll concede to that demand, but then I want you to go easy with me concerning this thing. And we try to negotiate. We, we try to barter. Can't do that with the Word. <laughs> it's non-negotiable. It is life-changing. When the Word of God comes to us, it does change our lives. I think in the church today, just across the, the broader landscape of what I'm seeing, we are forgetting the power of the gospel. It gets in your business. And guess what? Supernaturally, He changes you from the inside to the outside. It is truly life-changing. And not only that, it's life-giving. Not only have we forgotten the power of the gospel, we've forgotten that if we pull away from the gospel, we die. The Word sustains us. It's life-changing, but it's also life-giving. And how many of us, let's be honest, we're okay staying away from the Word for a little while. Ah, I didn't read my Bible today. Uh, you know what? Come to think of it, I don't think I read it yesterday. Well, I know I had my Bible out Sunday because I took it to church to impress the pastor. Um, you know, and he wasn't paying attention to me, so I walked in front of him three times with my Bible under my arm. Uh, so I know I, I know I had it out Sunday, but, but you know what, Saturday, no, I didn't get it out Saturday. Really, I don't know. Let's see, two weeks, last month. We've all been guilty of that. Amen. We have to understand this is life changing and it is life giving. It is confrontational. It is confrontational. The Word of God has a way of coming into your life and meeting you head on, okay? The, the, the Word of God, it, it, is, it is living and it is active, according to the author of Hebrews. Living and active, meaning that when it comes into your life, it, it is tenacious. It's like a bulldog, okay? If you think for one moment that you're going to get away from the Word, you're not going to get away from the Word, okay? If you're here tonight and you're not a believer, you think, okay, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to go home. I'm going to be like Jonah. I'm going to run from the presence of the Lord. 
It's what the Puritans used to say, it's the felt presence of the Lord. Because we know in the grand sense you cannot run from the presence of the Lord because he's everywhere. But we want to run from the felt presence of the Lord. We don't like the conviction that we feel when we're confronted with the word. So if you're not a believer, you want to run away. Okay? I remember being in a revival one time in Marion, Illinois. It was one of the greatest supernatural evenings that I've ever spent. And I remember at the time of invitation, there were people three and four deep around the altar and just crawling on our hands and knees and just praying one to another. We had a man there that was healed of cancer. Uh, There were other things that were happening. There was a marriage that was repaired. And there was a gentleman that had come in the back and he came in late and he said to the sermon, and Bob, he, he was there and he was watching the invitation and suddenly, and he was seated about where you are in the sanctuary. And all of a sudden he jumped up with a loud voice and said, I can't take it anymore. And he ran out the back door. Even as believers, we think we can run from the felt presence of the Lord. So we shut our Bibles. Listen, you cannot run from it. And you have to own the reality that the word is confrontational. Okay? I mean, it, it confronts you where you are and, and what you're doing. It's confrontational. Nola, do you really think that's a good idea? I think that's why we sometimes leave our Bibles closed. Because we don't got in our business. But God is in our business. We belong to Him. Amen. And even if you leave your Bible closed, the Spirit is still working in you to confront you. And we're grateful for that. Finally, it's eternal. In that the Word of God extends not only in that sense of the earth, but it extends into eternity. Amen. It is the hope of the gospel, the word of the cross that's going to carry me beyond the grave into the presence of Jesus, and I'll live with him forever. Amen. All right? So you have this teaching, you have this word, and it's coming from Christ. It's final, it's authoritative, it's non-negotiable, it's life-changing, life-giving, confrontational. It's eternal. Now, many of his disciples heard this. They said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Now, I want you... We're on the honor system here, okay? Sometime in the next day or two, I'll give you two days, read all of John 6 and you'll understand what's being said. There are some really hard things that Jesus is sharing in this passage of Scripture. Amen. Really hard things about eating his body and drinking his blood. Okay? Eating his body, drinking his blood. I've said this, I am a pastor. Uh, We partake of the Lord's Supper. We celebrate communion. And, And to me, it is still a mystery. The eating of the body and the drinking of the blood. I, I think it's more than just a memorial. And, and I, I share that because if I, as a New Testament believer, have the Spirit of God living in me, if I, if I sense the mystery, and I'm okay with it, but if I sense the mystery, how did it sound to these people? Jesus is talking about eating his body and drinking his blood on the other side of the cross. How did it sound to their ear? Yeah. And you see why, hey, this is hard. You know, who can accept it? Well, what happened? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked them, does this offend you? Then what if you would observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, but there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe, and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back, and they no longer accompanied him. Now, I'm going to say this, all right? Here, we're going to get into the meat of it, if you will. In the midst of the story, you have Judas. Okay, he's the elephant in the room. And John, in writing the gospel, inserts information about Judas, and then Jesus in the dialogue of the gospel references Judas. He's there. Now listen, you're not naive. You understand that we are living in a fallen world. Many of you have have shared stories with me privately about things that are happening in your life or things that are happening in the lives of people that you love and care about, and there's been this devastation. There's a darkness. There's hardship. There's heartache. We live in a fallen world. You understand that? And, and at times, we're very apt to think that the devil is winning. Don't. Don't think for a moment that the devil 
is winning. He is not. Jesus is the king. He has not left his throne. He has not surrendered. I want you to understand that all of his promises are going to come to pass. That in the end, we win. Amen. The devil is not winning. In the end, we as believers, we win. Does that make sense? Amen. Hang on to that. Okay? Hang on to that. Now, let me say this. Even as believers, we're going to struggle. Even as believers, we're going to struggle. I know this. I am saved by grace through faith. I know this. I have eternity with Christ in my future. And I say that not bragging. I have nothing to brag about. Grace eliminates bragging. I say that with certainty because Christ has told me that if I come to him, I will be saved. Amen. I heard men years ago talking, some older gentlemen. They said, oh, I'm a Christian. The other man said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. The third man said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. And all three, they use this language. Well, I hope when we die, we get to go to heaven. And, 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 you know, I wanted to go over and sit down and say, listen, the whole reason you're a Christian is that you have the assurance that when you die, you do get to go to heaven. Amen? I, I know this. There is the certainty that I belong to God, but I also know this. There is a certainty that I have an enemy who's coming against me, and he's going to do everything that he can to get me to turn away. He's going to do everything that he can to get me to turn aside. That there's going to be some consequence. There's going to be some fallout. There, there, there's going to be some kind of a death that's going to come to me. All right? Now, I'm not talking about an eternal death. I'm not talking about condemnation. But I'm talking about some kind of death that's going to come to me by sin and by disobedience, by my own choosing. All right? Even as a believer. Okay? So I, I think we have to ask ourselves some questions. Why did these people go away? Why did they go away? Let me begin with this. There were some that went away because they were simply curious about Jesus. They were a part of the crowd. Henry Blackaby, he wrote the Experience in God series. He always talked about the crowd within the crowd. That in the ministry of Jesus, you would have the crowd. But then within the crowd, you had those people that were actually getting it. They were hanging on the words. And they were being sustained by the words. They were given life by the words. And the rest of the people, they were just kind of there as window dressing. I have news for you. We have that in our churches Sunday after Sunday. We have people that come and they're curious. They're a part of the crowd. But then you have the people, the crowd within the crowd that actually know him. And they're receiving the words and they're hanging on those words. And they're given life by those words. They're sustained by those words. There are some people that were simply curious about Jesus. Curiosity cannot sustain you. Understand that curiosity cannot sustain you. At some point, you have to make a decision. I'm hearing these really hard things. There's a hard teaching that's coming to me. I'm not going to hang around because I'm curious. When it gets hard, I guess what I'm going to do if I'm curious, I just go away. Okay? I mean, you come to the proverbial fork in the road. At some point, you have to make a decision. I'm either going to go with Christ or I'm not going to go with Christ. There were some, yeah, they were curious. Other people, though, if you look in verse 26, and I'll read it for you. Verse 26, I assure you, you are not looking for me. I assure you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. Some were attracted to the loaves. In other words, they wanted the benefit of Christ, but they did not want to hear his word. Mm. Some just curious. I want to come see what the show's about. Curiosity wears off. There are some that are attracted to the loaves. They're attracted to what Jesus Christ can give them, but they don't want to receive his word. Amen. They want nothing to do with his word. We find that probably in the greatest display when you have people that they don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven. But I just don't want Jesus to do anything else with my life. Right, I, I, I want the loaf of missing hell and going to heaven. That when I die, everybody can know where I am, but I don't want Jesus to come and to do anything else with my life. I just want to be able to live the way that I want to live and not have to worry about this Jesus thing, but in the end, I want to be okay. 
guess what? Curiosity and these perceived benefits, they cannot sustain faith. They are no substitute for faith. Then you stay there. That moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. And Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, who will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. If you look at that, you have another group of people that were offended by his teaching. Okay? They, they were offended by his teaching. Okay? Some were curious, they went away. Some just wanted the benefits, and when the benefits ran out, uh, they went away. But there were others that really were hanging on these words, but then they realized, wait a minute, I don't want to have to deal with what it is that he's telling me. So what did they do? They went away because they were offended. They were offended. Now Peter made it very clear, we're not going away because we what? We believe. We what? We believe. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus asked a question about doing the work of God or the work of the kingdom, depending on the translation that you use. He said, here's the work, believe. It's so simple, we try to complicate it. And it really is so simple, but yet it's so simple, it offends people. I found that to be true. It offends people. What, what do you mean I, I, I'm a sinner and I can't help myself? There's got to be something else to it. There's nothing else to it. You are a sinner. Come to the end of yourself. Relent. Believe in Jesus and be saved. Amen. You know how frustrating that is to try to pray with someone. And, and, and they, keep, they keep pushing back. They keep pushing back. They are offended by the fact that they are just beggars, that they come empty-handed. They are offended by the fact that they are at the mercy of the living God, that they have nothing to offer, that they can't work it off. It's not a matter of good works and bad works. They are offended by the things that Jesus says to them, in particular about salvation. And I'm going to say something. If we're not careful, even as believers, we are apt to be offended by the Word of God and turn away, at least for a time. I've seen that. And you've seen it. Believers that want to harbor sin. We want to openly welcome rebellion. And we don't want the word to deal with it. And so we're offended by the fact that Jesus would, would make demands and that Jesus says, no, I, we need to change this and we need to change that. Listen, he loves you as you are, but he loves you enough to change you. Okay? He loves you as you are, but he loves you enough to change you. And listen, that change is going to happen. Okay? I often tell people this. If you are, now listen, if you really are a Christian, God is obligated to change you, and you are going to be changed, whether you want to be or not. My dad's a retired police officer. My dad could tell you stories of arrests that he's made, and one of my dad's favorite sayings was this, we can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. I hear people say, you know, God doesn't force himself and, and, and God just doesn't do those things. I'm thinking, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Have you read the book of Jonah? Okay, Jonah in three sentences. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, God, I will not go to Nineveh. Sentence number three, Jonah went to Nineveh. Okay? You, you, you think about where would you be if, if God had not overwhelmed you? Where would you be if God had not forced his way into your life? When I pray for somebody, I don't pray for God to be polite. I don't. And you don't either. You know, Jesus said no man comes to the Father unless he's drawn. Now again, there's, there's a mystery because I have to choose and people have to preach. And we have very real choices and real consequences. But again, there's that supernatural element. So when I pray, I'm praying God overwhelms somebody. Get a hold of them. Okay? Listen, I know this. As a believer, I've been around long enough to know that when I'm offended by the word, I cannot outrun that word. That word is going to be waiting for me around every corner. Amen. Don't turn away. Don't leave. There's going to be heartache. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be loss. Okay? But make no mistake, if you really are a believer, God's going to sanctify you. 
And God is going to work his will in your life one way or the other. Amen. But I have to be on guard. Because if just left to my own devices, if I'm, if I'm not willing to fight the spiritual fight, I'll turn away because I'm offended. And I do not want to be offended by the word of God. Jesus said, blessed are you if you are not offended by me. I want to be blessed. Amen. I don't want you just to be curious about it. I want you to believe and I want you to know. I get over my offense by knowing it's Jesus. And I believe in him and I'm his. And we're going to work through it. Amen.